Hey everyone, I'm just working on stately x state v5 beta docs. So we'll see how this goes. Go ahead and bump the font size up here. So you all could see. Tweet it out. Hey, Judy Kyle. Just working on some documentation. Feel free to ask me anything related to X8 version 5. Just felt like doing them in prompty stream. Okay, let's get started. So first of all, I want to talk about uh, what's actually happening over here. So this is a branch that we currently have called xdate v5 outline, or I believe that's a branch name. Yeah, v5 dash outline. And so this is in the stately AI slash docs repo. The entire point of this is that we're completely reworking the documentation for xdate version 5. And uh, if you haven't known, um, we actually did release Xstate v5 beta. So it is live right now. It's just that the documentation now that the dust has settled uh, needs to be written. So, um, so far we have a bunch of pages and I've organized them, um, or me and Laura have organized them in a way that uh, it sort of makes sense, or at least more sense, hopefully, as a you know, beginner X state user or someone who's brand new to the idea of state machines, state charts, or X state um, to, to go through each of these pages and learn everything. But one of our goals was to do it in a way that you could be immediately productive um, without having to read the entire documentation. So uh, we have this little switch over here. X state V4 refers to the old documentation and you're going to notice that in x 8 v 5 we have a lot less nesting. So just to go through the, um, the areas real quick, we have the Stately Studio, of course. We have state machines, and state machines start with, well, state machines first. So um, let's see, I was working on this just the other day. So we have some code examples for you know, quickly creating a state machine. And one of my goals for all these code examples is to just show um, the entire code example, including the imports. So you could just copy this and paste it directly into your project and have it fully working. So I think that that's, I think that that's a pretty good design goal. Um, of course, there will be sections where it's just a little bit too verbose to do that. So um, you know, you'll notice, for example, over here that it just assumes that we're continuing off of this previous example. Another uh, design choice is that we are focusing on a single machine. And of course, there's going to be plenty of examples. But the one example in particular is this feedback machine. And so this could be your typical feedback form, where we're starting in the question state. And if you click good, it takes you to thanks. If you click bad, it takes you to a form where you could actually fill out something. Uh, and submit that feedback. And then eventually it takes you to thanks. And then pressing escape on any key should take you to the closed state. And so that is our model machine that we're going to be using throughout the entire docs. And as it turns out, that machine is simple enough to be easily understood, but complex enough such that uh, all of the concepts are pretty easy to represent in that machine. Oh, so I'm trying to think where I should start today. Um, I've just sort of been picking away at all of these uh, documentations. If you have 
or all of these pages. So if you have suggestions, um, I'm all ears. Uh, actually, let's let's take a look at input. I think input's going to be a good one to to work on right now, uh, just because input is a brand new thing and it's actually really really exciting because it gets rid of a a bunch of um, I guess you could call them ad hoc patterns. Okay, so let's see. Input refers to the data provided to the state machine. Um, yeah, so the idea is that you could now in lazy context, whatever you want to call it, uh, you could provide input in here. And so input is provided through, um, through this argument. And so when you start the machine, you could start it with input. And so that's what I wanted to highlight over here. Uh, hey, Alex. So thanks for your work so far. V5 looks awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, just working on the docs so that everyone could uh, start kicking the tires on x v 5 beta um, as soon as possible. In fact, you can right now. It's just sort of shooting in the dark because there's not documentation that's public. Well, actually, it's it's on a branch. Like, we're not hiding anything. So you could definitely still see it. Uh, Judy Kyle says, is it like a default value? You could definitely think about it that way. So um, actually, that's that's something good to put in here. So we have initial event input. Let's see, invoking actors with input. So this, by the way, applies to any actor, not just state machines. Um, so a, a useful example is over here. I'm not sure if you could see that that well. I wonder if I could zoom in or, oh wow. I cannot zoom in in here in this simple browser, unfortunately. Um, hmm. Okay, well, anyway. Actually, I could just show you over here because the example is a little bit clearer there. Um, let's see, what was I going to show you? Oh, yeah, so with from promise. So things like from promise, you have an input as well. And so let's say that you pass in the domain. Um, and so you could provide that directly to that, uh, that promise over there. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, let's see, spawning actors with input, uh, invoking actors with input. So, okay, I'm going to add an example over here because, uh, let's see, invoking. So with invoking actors with input, uh, I state that you could provide input to invoked actors via the input property of the invoke configuration. So uh, you could see it over there. Um, but yeah, so I should probably add a section here, interpreting actors with input because the motivating example I want to show you is that you could, for example, take a promise and um, you, know, you could give it some sort of input. So let's say that you want to uh, fetch a user. So let's, okay, import interpret. And I'm going to also interpret, or sorry, import from promise. So um, we could say const user fetcher equals from promise. And so the idea is that we're provided some sort of input. And from that, we could, thanks, Copilot, we could fetch like slash user slash input user ID and then uh, return the JSON from that. It's actually pretty scary and awesome how well um, Copilot understands everything that's going on over here. Uh, so if we wanted to call it with some specific input, we could say const, let's see if it actually, uh, OK, maybe I need to give it a little bit of help. So user fetcher actor, whatever you want to name it, uh, you interpret that user fetcher and you give it an input. I'm going to let Copilot do its thing. Here we go. And so now what's going to happen is that um, after a while, so we could subscribe to that or we, we could use undone. I guess that works too. 
Um, it's going to give us, well, it shouldn't give us, oh yeah, well, well, I mean, pretend it gives name David. So logs the user data for user the one, two, three. So um, that's how you provide it. By the way, uh, I really love how DocuSource has these inline comments for highlighting. So yeah, really like that. It makes it really cool or really clear to see what's happening over here. I wish that they did inline highlights for the actual text over here, but I guess they don't. Go to questions. Right now I'm working on a machine dealing with a list of generic items to add, remove, update each item. Uh, it's an interesting use case because with X8, the logic to manage a single item is more simple when you start. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. So, hmm. Right now I'm working on a machine dealing with the list of generic items to add, remove, update each item. Uh, so I, I think that fits into sort of like a to-do example where you have a bunch of to-dos, you want to manage them all, and maybe each one of them uh, has to be an actor or something. Is, is that right? I don't know. Okay, so... Uh, let's see what else I have to finish up here. We have initial events input. And so this just explains that the, um, the initial events that you have, it's going to have a type of xState.init. I'm not sure if that's useful or not to actually expose to the user or to you, the developer. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm just including there, it there for completion. Uh, the idea is that when you enter the machine, you always will get this init event, this xState.init event. The thing that changes in v5 is that init event has an input property. And that input property has things like, uh, well, whatever you input. So in this case, we have user ID 123. Again, apologies if you can't see that. I know that that's pretty small. Um, let me bump up the font even more that you could at least see it over here. Uh, so yeah, you, you have like things like user ID one, two, three default rating five, and that's passed in directly to that events.input. So you could, um, I mean, of course it's first class in lazy context. So you get the input over there, but if you want to do anything in entry with that input data, then you get it from, uh, you know, from there. So, um, Oh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna add a little note here. Um, notes input, yeah, input data is not persisted in the machine. If you want to um, persist input data, then you could do so in the machine's context. Wow, um, Copilot has been helping a lot uh, with all of this um, by assigning or. No, or actually, yeah. So you you could um, you know, you could use the machine's context. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if that's useful because we already explained that over here. Um, yeah. So interpreting actors with input, um, any actor can be. Uh, by the way, I'm just writing rough thoughts in here. Later, I'm just going to go and uh, and clean it all up. So any actor can be provided input when it is interpreted. That's absolutely correct. Um, this input is read. Actually, that's too passive. Uh, you can read this input. Um, by the way, I'm sort of struggling with What's it called this? So from promise, we have from promise, from observable, from transition, from callback, all of these things, they don't return actors. Instead, they return the same thing that create machine returns. It's not exactly a state, like a full on state machine state chart, like create machine returns. But instead, it's that same blueprint of, um, of you know, something that you use to invoke, interpret, create an actor. So um, I've been opting. So internally, we call it actor behavior, but I'm opting in the documentation to probably call it actor logic. 
So you could read this input, but that, that might be a bit obscure. Um, in the, or you could read this input uh, from the input property of the first argument to um, action logic creators. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure uh, what do we call these, um, such as from promise. There is no from service from, uh, you know, from observable, uh, from transition. Etc. Yeah, the input is read uh, from here, and then you know, that that becomes part of the logic. So again, I'm not too sure what to call that. Uh, so I'll just add a note over here. Actually, I yeah, interpreting actors with input. Just gonna say to do show examples for. Um, yeah, from transition, from observable, and all of those other things. Okay, so we also have initial events input. And so the idea is that when you're reading this documentation, you should be able to get up and running even with just the first example. So that's, again, sort of my goal. You're reading the docs and you're like, okay, I just need a quick reference or I just want to learn about the basics real quick. And there you have it. You could just use this example copy it and you're good to go. And then if you want to dive further into details, then you could just keep scrolling. Uh, Nan Montano says, what's the difference between actor behavior logic and a machine? Uh, there really is none. Um, so the idea is that, and I'll just uh, do this all the way down here. Just have an empty to do. Um, so let's say that you have a machine. You would have const machine equals create machine, and you would have stuff in here. You could also have a, let's call this um, promise logic, and you would have from promise. And so this would be a function that returns some sort of promise. Uh, you could also have const um, callback logic, we'll call it. And this is from callback. And you have your send back and receive, and you could you know do stuff in here. Uh, you have other stuff too, so you have observable logic. So, um, and this is just like a lazy way of creating an observer. So, uh, let's say that you're importing from RxJS and you want something on an on a one second interval. So you could have something like that, um, and then you have your reducers or uh, transitions. So const uh, transition logic equals from reducer, and then copy and paste your Redux reducers or your use reducer reducers. You could use it all the same. I mean, it's exactly the same thing. You just need to pass in an initial state like count zero. Um, okay, so the point of all that is to say that these <clears throat> in version five, these are all basically the same thing, which means that you could say const actor equals interpret machine. You could start it too. And you could go even further. You could say const uh, promise actor equals interpret, come on, copilot, promise logic. Let's see if it does the rest. Observable actor, transition actor. Um, so all of these are actors. All of these have exactly the same interface. And that means that even though you are going to have the most number of features uh, by using state machines, of course, because state machines, they could send events, they could receive events, they could invoke and spawn actors, uh, they could communicate freely with actors, they could be done like a promise, they could emit events like observables, they could do a ton of things. So you could think of machines as a superset of all of these. You could still write your logic with any of these. So let's say that, you know, you're using X state and you're trying to have this logic work with the rest of your actors that you create. So like maybe you have some state machines, but you're saying, you know, my logic is actually, um, 
it's it's an async await function. It's just await this, await this, await that, and then return some data. And you're like, I really don't want to refactor that into a state machine. So the idea is that you would just do this. You would write an async function or copy and paste it. And so you could await do something, const data equals await do something else. You know, you could await promise.all, you know, you could just really go crazy, do whatever you want. You could eventually return some data. And this now becomes compatible with everything else in X state. So, um, you know, you can invoke that. Let's say that I move this down here. Let's say I create a machine and I say, you know what, that promise logic I have, I want it to be invoked when the machine starts. So you could just invoke source. Uh, I'm just gonna pass in that promise logic. Even give it an ID if you want. So, uh, you know, my promise logic. And that's it. So now you could do things like on done. You could do some sort of event. You could have on error, uh, you know, transition to somewhere. Um, so yeah, it, it completely works. And you could use pretty much anything else, you know, callbacks, observables, producers. Uh, so it's under the same unified API. So that's all to say that there really is no difference between them. The only difference is uh, really in the, you know, in what you could do with each type of, of behavior or logic. Again, I'm not entirely sure what to call it. I think I'm going to stick with calling it logic. <clears throat> I think something that may boost the docs a bit is to have a section called when to use this. That's, yeah, that's a really, really awesome suggestion. So actually, let's take a look at... Um, at input, just because we're working on the input docs right now. So we have the events, um, you know, so as you're reading this, you get a good idea of what input is. Input refers to the data provided to a state machine that influences its behavior. Uh, and hopefully that's, you know, sufficiently explanatory. You know, you provide data to the machine. Um, and I say state machine, but really you could do any sort of actor, but I just, uh, input, any actor can be provided input when it is interpreted. I don't like how that's worded. Um, let's see. Input can be provided to any actor. Actually, okay, so Laura told me this. Um, instead of doing sort of a passive thing, it's more of like a, I'm talking directly to the person. So I would instead say, you can pass input to any kind of actor. Um, was, all right, so now there's a lot of yous. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> by reading. See, that, that's a hard part of doing documentation is just, you know, going back and refactoring your own words. Uh, and that's actually where ChatGPT can help. Um, so Judy Kyle is saying, like, you know, when to use input. Yeah. So um, interpreting actors with input, we have the initial event, invoking actors with input. So hopefully there's enough of a difference between interpreting actors and invoking. Um, but so with invoking you could actually have input over here. So I'm just gonna highlight this. Light start. Let's go pilot. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is really good for when you need to, um, you know, you need to invoke something, but you also want to provide it some input. And so that input will be read in there. And you could also have dynamic inputs too. So that's one of the cool things about machines is you could say, hey, I want to get this thing from context. Uh, I wonder how useful it is to talk about like the old way of doing this because one big difference between uh, V4 and V5 is that these actors are standalone. And so it actually makes it more decoupled or I guess I should say less coupled because 
um, before you would you would have, uh, for example, the source as a function, and that function would take the context and the events and all of that. And so this actor was basically reading directly from that. Instead, what we're doing is this actor is saying, you know what, or sorry, this actor logic is saying, you know what, this is my input. And you know, you could strongly type it if you want to. I'm sure there's a way to do that. Haven't figured that out yet, but we're getting to that. Um, and uh, so I don't care which machine I'm called. I just want you to provide me with that input. So, uh, you know, that, that's why you have to map the input, you know, from context events, et cetera, onto the input that you pass that actor. Hopefully that all made sense. I also have a separate section on spawning actors because even though it's very similar to uh, what you would do for invoke, you know, you would have an input property and then you could pass it in here. Uh, the differences are enough that it sort of warrants its own section. Also, I have sections for TypeScript. Um, and so this is still a work in progress. And in fact, this is wrong. We're not using schema anymore. We're using types. So this is going to be types. And uh, you know, th this is how you define that. And I'm also going to add a few other notes on like how types are inferred, and things like that. Uh, but going to uh, Judy Kyle's point, I think it's a very good idea to add something like um, when to use this. Or I would just say use cases. So providing user input to a state machine, um, providing dynamic <laughs> providing input to spawn actors. Actually, this is all pretty basic. These aren't exactly... Um, direct use cases, but you know, they work. Uh, I could talk a little bit about the history of like, you would do it or how you would do it in V4 or how you used to do it. Um, but, you know. So input is useful for um, creating uh, reusable machines. Okay, that's good. Um, that can be configured with different input values. And then I, I you know, I, I would give some examples as well. Um, and so this allows you to, I'm going to just write a note here. So uh, this uh, replaces the old way of writing a factory function for machines. And I think that this is a common enough like thing that people have done that it should be immediately recognizable that, oh, okay, I could actually use input instead of doing it that way. Uh, so for example, the old way of doing it, so I'm just gonna say const old machine. Um, but I, I would do something like const create uh, feedback machine. Oh, wow, cool. Uh, so this is old way using a factory function. So you can see that we're we have a function now, which is taking in user ID, it's taking in default rating. But here's the thing, even though you and I can see that this is definitely a machine that it is being returned, as far as JavaScript and you know whatever, like some sort of dev tool knows, this function is essentially a black box. Like we could say uh, return math.random is less than 0 0.5 and this, and then maybe another machine, like it's non-deterministic. Uh, and so that's a problem because this is really a workaround because we were missing input. So it's going to say new way using input. And so let's see how smart copilot is. There we go. So this would be the new way of doing it. And then, you know, you would call the old way with, const uh, feedback machine equals, we call this feedback machine one, I'll fix all this up later. And then th there is no need to like create one because you know we could actually just use an actor over here. And then, so this would be const feedback actor one equals, you know, we interpret that then start it. Uh, so, the old way of doing it, there was no way to say, or to declaratively say, here's my input. The new way of doing it, there is. And so I think that it's more explicit, it's more clear, um, it's just a better, better way. So 
what do you think, Judy Kyle? Do you think that that's a good, um, you know, good way of talking about the use cases? I mean, we, we could definitely give more examples. And yeah, I completely agree. Copilot is really great. Um, Marcel says, I haven't fully migrated to schema and it already has been changed to types. Uh, so what's really awesome is that Mark Chandler with Hearts, you've probably seen him on uh, GitHub and other places, uh, has been working on a code mod. And so that code mod, um, if you do have schema, then it just becomes types. So um, there's a lot of very straightforward migration from X dates to um, or X eight V four to X eight V five, and so we're going to try to cover as much of that using code mods as possible. Um, I've also been um, oh, this is useful. So I've also been um, making cheat sheets. And so these cheat sheets are just like, let's say you've read the documentation before, or you just really want to, you know, fix something up real quick in the project. So the cheat sheet would just be a really quick way of referencing, okay, how do I do a thing? And so for example, providing input is like that, providing it to invoked actors, you would put it here for dynamic input, you would do this. Uh, so this is basically the documentation without the craft, without the extra information. And so in further resources, what I'm going to be doing is uh, we're creating a bunch of examples. And so I'm going to link to each of the examples, um, you know, in the resources. Take a sip of water. I'm talking too much. All right. Another really cool. Oh, and Judy Kyle said just one or two examples is fine. IMO. Yeah. I agree. Too many examples doesn't hurt. So, you know. Um, I've also been using a really cool tool called Cody. Uh, if you haven't used Cody, I really, really recommend it. It's by the fine folks over at Sourcegraph. And so Cody can actually answer questions. It's sort of like ChatGPT. And I promise this is not a paid ad or anything. Cody is completely free to use. Um, but Cody understands not only what ChatGPT understands by default, but it also understands your code base and it understands open gra or uh, source graph and repos like open source repos in general. So Sorry, I think my internet cut off. <laughs> okay, so what I was doing, I don't know how much of that, you know, was lost, but um, yeah, so Cody actually figured out by reading my documentation what input is. And so it said input refers to the data provided to a state machine that influences its behavior. Okay, so it basically copy pasted from there. Um, so I could ask it a question like, um, can I, uh, what types of things can I pass into input? Like something that's not directly in the documentation. Um, and it says you can pass any data into the input for an actor. Some common examples include user IDs, default values, API endpoints, configuration options. Um, it's wow. And it, it even suggested things like API endpoint, which I don't have in the docs, but it's really great that it came up with that example. Um, so I could even say, can you give me an example of passing input for uh, for a simple game machine. I even misspelled machine just to see what it would do. <laughs> All right, so it actually gave, okay, yeah, this is a really good example. And so this is why I, I really love Cody because uh, as I'm going through the docs, 
I would ask it questions as if a user were asking it questions. And um, it gives me a really good way of framing it. It's not correct 100% of the time because it's ChatGPT, um, but it's right pretty frequently. For example, there's GameActor.getContext. That does not exist. <laughs> so don't worry, that's not a new XHP5 API. Uh, but for example, I asked for in a simple game example, and I could actually use this directly in here. So if we're creating a game, I might get the player name as an input, and I could put that directly in context. So that, yeah, it's a pretty good example. Marcel says, uh, love that you're using our poor dev lives with code mod integration. I've never written a code mod, so I'm really interested in seeing um, how exactly it works out. Uh, I think code mods are really cool and really useful. In further resources, I'm going to put things like just, again, links to examples. But also, there, for a lot of these topics, there is already prior art on these state machine topics, such as input. Uh, so I, I will do a lot of external linking as well. Okay, let's go on. Uh, events and transitions. Let's see if this collapses. Okay, awesome. So V5 events, transitions, or what did I call this? I think I just called it transitions. Yeah, I did. Okay. So let me just go through here. Um, a transition is a change from one finite state to another triggered by an event. Hopefully that's simple enough. Uh, to do example going from form to close, let's do that right now to start filling in some of these docs. So I would import create machine from X date. I've typed this a million times. Oh, <laughs> there's the example. Okay, so, um, you know, initial question, uh, you know, we would have question, but I'm not going to actually do this. Uh, but yeah, form on, okay, so I don't want to go there. I just want it to go to from submit uh, to, actually, no, you know what? I want to say on feedback.good, go to thanks. And so we could just say thanks. And there we go. And so um, transitions are deterministic. Each combination of state and event always points to the same states. And uh, you know we could easily just draw a, a state machine um, showing that fact. Um, something real quick. So if I go here, and this is something that we also want to do. Oh, why did it, okay. Uh, let's see, VS Code extension, we're gonna, huh, usually I get my, uh, the VS Code extension for X state. Is it installed? It is installed. It's just not, it, it probably doesn't show up on, um, files that don't exist. So right here, testing. Okay, so the file has to exist in order to do that. Um, so the idea is that I would have um, just a really small embedded version of the editor within the docs that shows something like this and have it be in simulation mode so that you know anyone who's reading the docs could go through and see like, oh, this is the visual representation of the code. And I'll even zoom in a bit over here. And so they're going to be able to click resets and then just go from one state to another. And, you know, we could do this with more and more examples as well. Uh, let's see when the state machine. So going back to the docs, when, uh, oh, yeah. So we have the to do full feedback example. I'm a bit lazy to do that. We also have sections on like how to use it in the stately studio. And we're going to be updating a lot of these. Um, in fact, Honestly, we're probably going to replace these with the, the embedded version. So, yeah. Uh, and so 
in the documentation, we're going to talk through all of the steps on how to add things like transitions and events and states and things like that. <clears throat> Hi, David. I've always struggled with making object lookups work for XState and TypeScript. For example, rendering a message based on the state. I don't like ternaries and switches. Will it be easier in V5? That's a good question. So uh, let me just put this as an example. In fact, I should rename this to example, but it's OK. Um, so object lookups, uh, rendering a message based on the state. OK, so there's a few ways that you could do this. And uh, it is a bit confusing that there is a few ways, but um, you know. Uh, one of the ways that I like is, um, instead of like using, you know, the state value or something like that, just put it directly in the machine. So let's say I have, uh, meta and then I have a, um, let's say, let's call it, or yeah, description or something like that. The question state asks the user for feedback. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm just going to say prompt. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, copilot. So let's say the prompt is how was your experience today? So now when you're like reading from the feedback machine, so let's say that you have, uh, const feedback actor equals you interpret the feedback machine and then you start it. Uh, if you're on the question state, then you're going to get, um, uh, let, let's call, you know, get snapshot. So feedback after dot get snapshot. So you're going to be able to read state.meta. And state.meta is going to be an object. And that object is going to have, uh, for example, uh, the state ID. So the ID is feedback question. So it's going to have something like, uh, feedback dot question and it, it's basically going to be like a normalized flat list and so it's going to have your description and the prompts in there and so what you could do is you could say object dot values uh, state dot meta and so that's just going to be an array of you know all of those things so you know your description and your prompt and then you could do with that you know as as you please so um, that's that's one way of doing it. And that actually prevents you from having to, um, you know, just having to, to match it on the states. Now, of course, if you don't want it on the states, then, you know, you would have to do something like, uh, which I think this is what you were uh, sort of alluding to, but you, want, you didn't want to do something like if state.matches, you know, question, which honestly is not too bad. <laughs> This is definitely not too bad. Uh, then you could just return uh, your description, you know, which is whatever you want, and your prompt, you know, which is whatever you want. Um, so there is that. The problem with that is, let's say that you go in the state machine and you say, you know what, I want to uh, change this state name. I want to call this prompt. This is a thing because there's a return outside the function. Okay, so I, I want to call this prompt. So it's going to uh, update the state machine, and there was an error, so I have to do that again. We are working on improving the extension, by the way. <coughs> okay, cool. So I changed it to prompt. <clears throat> the problem is that this you know, this right here is not going to work anymore. And it's not going to work because we changed the key from question to prompt. So think of this as a an ID. And if you want something closer to a class name, you could have like tags, you know, and it could be question or something like that. And so you could have multiple states that have the same tag. Or you could also give it an ID. So ID of question. So there's a few different ways of tackling this. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a data structure, it's an object. So it's really up to you to do whatever you want to uh, extract that data. And they're basically map data from your state machine 
um, to, uh, you know, to whatever you want. All right. Javier uh, Madueno says in the React components, when you change the input value, does the does the machine reinitialize? Uh, good question. So it's not going to because the the machine has already started, and so there's a big difference between starting a machine with input value and then providing it something later. Because when you provide it something later, you're basically saying um, that something happened. And so that idea of something happened is really more of an event rather than, uh, you know, rather than input or anything like that. Um, but actually, that's a that's a pretty good question. And now you're making me want to uh, update some things over here. So in input, I think that uh, for all right. So we have. Let's see. Oh, this is really useful. We have use cases, TypeScript, cheat sheet, uh, further resources. Um, I'm trying to think about like if I want to put like a section on how it's used in each of the libraries. I think that might go under use cases. Um, so yeah, I, I could do that. Use cases. So we could just say, uh, you know, use this is just a to do usage with let's say React, you know, and all of the other libraries. Uh, so nope, I'll work there. Uh, let's see, <laughs> we don't have that yet. Uh, we have Svelte, we have Solid, we have a, a bunch of others. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we could just basically include those examples in there. Uh, but it, it's basically going to be the same thing. Um, with X8 React and things like that, you can do this. So anything you pass in the second argument to use machine are what you pass in to interpret itself. So let's create a component over here. A const component equals, you know, let's say you have some props. And let's say that prop uh, that the props have some input data that you want to pass into the machine. So you would do exactly this. Thanks, Copilot. Um, yeah. So you you would put input in here. So again, uh, when input changes, I'm still not sure yet, but I don't think that this is just going to uh, reinitialize. Um, at least it shouldn't. And okay, so the reason it shouldn't is because it's not the way that React works with, uh, for example, use reducer and things like use actor, use machine, use inter use interpret are most analogous to use reducer. So, did you know that when you use reducer and you provide it with an initial state, and then uh, that initial state may come from uh, props or somewhere else, but when that initial state changes. The reducer is not going to start over, believe it or not. It's not going to start over. It's going to still be at the same state, and it's just going to keep doing its thing. So um, in the same way, this is you know what would happen over here. So that's why right now it's a little unfortunate, but the idiomatic way of saying like, hey, something actually changed is to use effect, my favorite hook, and you know, let's say that props.user ID changed. You would um, you would send an indication that uh, type uh, you know user ID dot change, and then you would just give it that user ID. So it's a little bit boilerplatey, but this is actually something that you know you have to do in like e even without X8 React um, in other libraries as well. Just the idea of communicating that something changed over. So it, for example, if this were use reducer and you need it to pass external data to use reducer, then you have to do the same thing, which is a little bit annoying, but that's, that's the way it is. I mean, maybe we could provide better ways of doing that, but I don't know. All right, yeah, so, um, in fact, I'm gonna keep this as an example. So, uh, so to do, 
notes. Um, if you want external prop changes, or uh, there's a better way of saying that. Uh, changing the input will not cause the machine to be, or I'm going to say the actor, to be restarted. Uh, you need to send an event to the actor, uh, to, or not to change the input, but uh, to pass the new data to the actor. Again, I'll phrase that better, but uh, I'm glad that you asked that because it is something that we should include in the docs. OK, so I was on transitions. So let's, uh, let's go there. Events. This is V4. It's not what I want. So let's see if I could go back. Events and transitions. OK, so um, just to give you sort of a lay of the land, uh, we have using transitions in the Stately Studio and then all the things you could do. Uh, one of the things that we explain here is what an event object is. And so an event object in X data events are represented by event objects with a type property. I realized that I didn't, um, I didn't really explain what an event is. Well, I actually did. An event is an occurrence uh, that can trigger a transition. So let me make this bold. We have a transition is a change from one finite state to another. An event is an occurrence that can trigger a transition. Um, now, this makes it look like an event is much more complicated than a transition. So I'm going to clean that up a bit. Cool. So a transition is this. An event is an occurrence that can trigger a transition. Uh, yeah. OK. So transitions are deterministic, which I think is a very important word. Each combination of state and event always points to the same next state. Um, let's see, to do full feedback example. OK, so I was down here. In X8, events are represented by event objects with a type property and optional payload. Um, <clears throat> I'm using payload in the general sense. So payload is, it's not a specific property. So we don't have like a payload over here. So hopefully that's not confusing. Um, instead, payload is just whatever else is on the object. So it could have a type, and it could have other stuff with it. The type property is a string that represents the event's type. Sounds like in, like it's tautology. <laughs> the payload is an object that contains additional data about the events. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, a migration note, and these are all things that I have to write up, but you can no longer send a string. So you're not allowed to do this. You have to do this. Um, see if Copilot knows. Okay, yeah. So this is mainly for typing. And so the reason for this is that uh, you don't want some events to do this and then some events to be the fully typed. So like an event with payload. So now you have, an, you, you have a mismatch. You have strings for some areas, objects for other areas. So there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, it simplifies the types. Number two, it just makes your code a lot more consistent when everything is a string. So um, <clears throat> that's going to be important to point out in the docs. Uh, OK, so I also have a section on selecting transitions, too. Um, I think that this is important because, and I want to make a diagram for this, too. But um, this sort of tries to make it intuitive, like what the algorithm is actually doing to select a transition, because I think that this is one of the one of the parts that I definitely just 
completely omitted from the um, you know from the original documentation, but it is important to understand. And so, let me actually. Okay, I'm going to draw a diagram for this. So let's say that you have a state machine, and we're going to use our, um, you know, our traditional traffic light, just because that's the only thing I can think of right now. And so, a state machine always has a root node. And so basically, when you uh, like, let's just call this light. Um, so what I mean by root node is that when you have a machine like create machine and you, ooh, that should be left aligned, and it's just an object, so nothing else in it, just this, then this is the root node. When you have children, so when you have states, uh, these are child nodes. nodes. So uh, you know, right now you're in the root node, and then you have child nodes inside. Okay, so you could, uh, let's say we have, let's make this colorful too. Come on, green, grebe. <laughs> uh, yellow maybe, and red. By the way, if you don't, if you aren't familiar with TL Draw, I highly, highly recommend it. It's such a great tool. So, um, okay. So these are okay. I'll just draw an arrow, I guess. So these are, um, you know, this green is child state of light, yellow is the child state of light, red is the child state of light, and red itself could contain. Uh, other child states. So, you know, we could have like your typical uh, walking smaller and stop where, where you should, you know, stop walking. So the idea is that, um, okay, let's say that we have a transition from emergency on the root node to uh, to red. So let me just draw that out for you real quick. Uh, so should be bigger and make it really bold. So emergency, okay. Why it's like that, make it a little bit smaller. Um, and then we, we might have other arrows too. So from green to yellow, we might have just T for timer. Let's do another one, yellow to red. We have T for timer. And of course, red back to green, we have T for timer. Um, and there's a reason I'm using TL draw and not uh, stately. It, it's because I'm trying to describe like the flow of how transitions are chosen. Okay, so let's say that we're in the yellow states. And I'll just fill this in. In the yellow state, let's say that the emergency event happens. So what's going to happen is the algorithm is going to check from the bottom, so the leaf nodes, and it's going to just keep going up. So we check yellow. Does yellow have a transition for emergency? No, it doesn't. So now we move to the parent. Does light have a, uh, a transition for emergency? Yes, it does. So we go from the bottom to the top and we decide to take this transition because we didn't find one in yellow. I'll just go ahead and fill that in. And so now the next state is going to be red, not yellow. So that's, that's how transitions work, and that's how transitions are chosen. And so in the documentation, I explain it this way. We start on the deepest active node states, and I'm going to definitely include a diagram like this. So we start by checking yellow. And um, you know, if, if a transition is enabled and the guard passes, then take it. Uh, there, there is no transition for emergency. Um, and so then we go up. So if no transition is enabled, go up to its parent state and repeat these steps. So let's, let's do this. Let's say uh, <laughs> emergency, but only if it's a real emergency. Um, I don't know what constitutes a real emer emergency or not. It's just an example. Uh, but so let's say that we go up to the lights. It's an emergency, but real emergency does 
it, it evaluates to false. So this transition will actually not be taken either. So there's nowhere else to go. And so because there are no transitions, then the state is going to remain the same. So even though the emergency event happened and was received by the machine, we're still going to stay in the yellow state. And hopefully the cars move out of the way anyway, because that's what you're supposed to do, according to law. But yeah, that's the main idea. Okay, so going here, uh, self-transitions. This is also, you know, was a pretty interesting topic. A uh, state can transition to itself. It's known as a self-transition. And this is useful for changing context and for executing actions. This is actually super important because a self-transition, um, I, I sort of explain it like uh, when we start talking about state machines, because I, I want people to get immediately familiar with like just doing something with a state machine and basically doing exactly the same thing that they could do with something like Redux, Zustand, uh, UX, Pinia, all of these libraries where it's just an event happens, do something. And so that's why in the, um, you know, in, in the examples over here, or I think it's over there, somewhere over here. Uh, I do have like a get started thing. So let's do install X date. Whoa, that's a lot. Okay, so I did have a quick start somewhere. Not sure where it is. Uh, but I, I basically want to show an example of like, hey, here's something that you could do. Um, right. Let me just check this real quick. Yeah, if not, then I'll definitely add it. But I, I, I want to show people that there's an easy way to just use state machines for doing really, really basic stuff. And that way is, uh, you know, let's take this example again. Let's say that you didn't have any of these states. So you didn't have feedback good, prompt or thanks, and you just had this. I think I should reload this. So you didn't have any of this. The idea is that you could get started really quickly by just adding self transitions. So let's say that this was a counter machine. You know, you could do a few things, you could increment. Um, it's yelling at me, but that's okay. You could uh, self-transition. You could decrement. Uh, you could reset. Like there's, there's just a bunch of things that you could do. And so the idea is that you should be able to get started really quickly by just, you know, just doing this, just defining events on your state machine and defining actions for those events which update context. So assign actions. Um, so I'm going to just go back through the docs and review that and just make sure that those simple examples are there. I think a counter example, as simplistic as it is, is actually pretty good because again, you have three events, those things could do stuff. And we could actually gradually introduce things like, um, like what happens if this, if the count is too big, what happens if it reaches a max value? then you're going to want to disable certain behaviors. And so, yeah, we could talk about that. And maybe I have a different example for that. Um, form on, let's see, context. Oh, okay. So this is actually uh, my simple example. So it's this machine over here. Uh, we have create machine and notice that I have no nested states. So I only have that root state that we were talking about. I have my context, which is feedback. I could add other things like rating, um, just uh, whatever else I want to add. And then we have all of our events over here. So we have feedback.update. We could even do feedback.clear. And just anything that you would do with a normal reducer you're going to be able to do with a state machine. And that's the main point that I want to bring across. So that's partially why I'm using the feedback example, just because it works really, really well like this. You could have a feedback form, which is literally just the form. It's not something that asks you 
did you have a good experience or a bad experience? It's just showing you that text box and you could fill it out. And as a developer, you might be thinking, I don't need a state machine for this, but really it's your state machine can be really simple. That's sort of the reframing that I want to, uh, you know, to put there because this is the complete state machine for, for something like that. So, all right. Anyway, so I, I went through a bunch of the docs. Uh, you know, we looked at transitions and we looked at input. I'm going to keep chipping away at these docs. Um, if you have any questions, I'm available on Discord or Twitter. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining me on this journey through uh, through the docs. I am going to be releasing these um, docs. Hopefully, uh, we're aiming for the end of this week. Um, so, yeah, if you want to check out these docs, it's at... I'll just type it over here. The branch is David K. Piano V5 outline. And this is the stately AI slash docs repo. And uh, so this is the work in progress. I would love to hear your thoughts. And I would love to just answer any questions you have and figure out, you know, how we could improve the docs and make it as intuitive and as little of a, um, a learning curve as possible. So thank you for joining.